Lord God, our Father, we come in this present hour. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. You've been mighty good to us. We thank you through many trials and tribulations and through years to come. Our ancestors have laid this foundation for us. And now we come to bring remembrance to these your people. We ask our Father now that thou will bless and anoint this service of prayer. Bless these young people who shall portray today. Bless and anoint this crowd to sing the songs of Zion. We ask that every head now that is present and bowed before thee, we ask that a fresh anointing will overpower us and bless us in this service. We ask for your guidance and direction in all that we do and say, and we shall continue to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And the people of God said, Amen. Our theme for today is Living Legends, Rewriting Social Action. You are in for a special treat as we celebrate the richness of our heritage through spoken word, singing, and presentations from the young voices of today. To give you a little bit of history about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, he dedicated his life to educating African Americans about achievements and contributions of their ancestors. In 1920s, uh, Dr. Woodson chose the second week of February to coincide with and pay homage to the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. He credited the two for ending, putting an end to slavery in America. In 1926, the Negro History Week was launched by historian Dr. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Paying tribute to black history in the United States began in the second week of February in 1926 in Washington, D.C. The tradition was extended to a month-long celebration in 1976. Educating children was very important to Dr. Woodson. He loved reaching children and worked to do so in the Negro History Bulletin, including interactive sec sections for puzzles and coloring. Even now in the organization that he created, there is a youth component called <coughs> Kimsha. I hope I said that right. Today, we want to pay homage to all our ancestors who persevered, and we want the next generation to remember how far we have come. Throughout our ancestry, we made it through uncertain times together as a community, and in 2020, we want the community to rekindle the passion of fortitude and resilience to propel the next generation forward. Our young folks are going to be portraying some amazing figures in black history. I am Bass Reeves. I made a groundbreaking discovery as being the first black man to be appointed as a U.S. Deputy Marshal west of the Mississippi. I was born in Crawford County, Arkansas on July 1838. I earned a reputation as courageous as a courageous lawman who really tackled the worst of them. As a black deputy, I am a daring and robust breed to help make life a little safer in a brown land as one of the most respected lawmen working in Indian, Indian territory. I learned to speak the language of five tribes. I achieved legendary status for the, for the number of criminals I captured. I became a legend during my lifetime for the ability to catch criminals under trying circumstances. I apprehended more than 3,000 fellows. I was considered a man whose dedication to law and order was second to none, but I also portrays a human being despite the obstacles and adversaries of my time and the disadvantage. Of no formal education, I was not deterred from achieving a life of fulfillment. My long career as a U.S. Deputy Marshal brought my admiration and respect both of what I earned and rich deserve. I am bad for you. I am Ernest Everett Just, a brilliant marine biologist who made lots of science discoveries about the cell behavior first position at Hatchery. I was the only black student at Dartmouth University, but I love science, and I had a minor in Greek. I graduated from there in 1907. I was a teacher at Howard University. I got my PhD from the University of Chicago and graduated first from a class. I did research at the Woods Hole Marine Biological at the lab in Massachusetts. I went on to write many papers and books. After traveling to France, Italy, and Germany, I moved there to do more research. Even though I wasn't treated fairly among other scientists, I made lots of discoveries in biology, zoology, and physiology. I am Dorothy Height. I made groundbreaking discoveries as a civil rights activist and a women's rights activist focused primarily on improving the circumstances and opportunities of African-American women. 
I was born March 24th, 1912 in Richmond, Virginia. At an early age, I became particular, particularly active in high school. I participated in anti-lynching campaigns. In 1932, I graduated New York University with an undergraduate degree and went on to earn a master's degree in educational psychology the very next year. After college, I became a social worker for the New York City Welfare Department. In 1937, I joined the staff of the Harlem YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association. I joined the National Council of Negro Women at age 25. As president of the National Council of Negro Women, I became a leader of the Black Civil Rights Movement. I was also a founding member of the Council for United Civil Rights Leadership. I helped organize the historic 1963 March on Washington where Martin Luther King delivered the famous I Have a Dream speech. I was highly respected by many U.S. presidents, including Barack Obama, and won awards such as the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1994 and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2004. A famous quote from Dorothy Height is, I have been in the proximity of and threatened by the Klan. I have been called everything people of color are called, and I have been denied admission because of a quota I've had. All that, but I've also learned that getting bitter is not the way. I am Colonel Charles Young. My parents were enslaved in Kentucky and fled to Ohio in 1864. I entered West Point on June 10, 1884, to become the only ninth African American to attend the academy and the only third to graduate. It was a lonely time at West Point because none of my white classmates would talk to me, so I made friends with the servants. In 1894, I took over teaching of the new military sciences and tactics courses at Wilberforce University. At Wilberforce, I established a marching band and became lifelong friends with W.E.B. Du Bois, who was also a professor there. When the Spanish-American War broke out, I was the first African-American African -American in history to command a sizable unit of the United States Army. I became the first African-American National Park Superintendent when my troops were tasked and maintained and maintain Sequoia National Park in Northern California. In one summer, my troops and I constructed roads, and for the first time in history, visitors were able to see the world's largest trees by riding their wagons on the new road. I served diplomatic posts in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Liberia, Mexico, to name a few places. In 1917, I made a historic 500-mile horseback ride from Oberforce, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., to prove that I could still fight even though I was 54 years old. During World War I, I wasn't, I wasn't promoted to rank of Brigadier General because white soldiers did not want to serve under a black man. So I was put on the inactive list because they said for high blood pressure. And I trained soldiers to fight for it. I thought Theodore Roosevelt was going to give me a chance because he wanted to start a volunteer division in the war. But President Woodrow Wilson refused to give Roosevelt permission to organize the volunteer division. I was a soldier, diplomat, and civil rights leader. You usually see me in a class in class of dresses standing beside my husband meeting with the world leaders. As I am a, as I am a former first lady. With my platform as first lady, I focused on health of of our children by by encouraging eating better and exercising. Mm -hmm. I am Michelle Obama. In 2009, I planted the White House kitchen garden on the South Lawn to start a national conversation around the health of and well-being of our, of our children. <coughs> that conversation led to Let's Move. At this time, 2.7 million children were obese. At the start of Let's Move, my husband, President Obama, established the first ever task force on childhood obesity. Let's Move is about is about putting children on the path uh, on the path to healthy future during their earliest month and months and years, giving parents helpful information about fostering environments that help healthy choices providing healthier foods for, in our schools, ensuring that every family has access to health, 
to health, affordable food, and there have been positive results from this program. But remember, it begins with you. Eat better and move. I am Michelle Obama. Hello, I am Ronald McNair. I was born on October 21st, 1950 in Lake City, South Carolina. I was an MIT trained physicist who specialized in laser research before joining NASA. In February 1984, I became the second African American to reach space. I died during the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986. Thank you. We need those young people research that and put that together themselves. A big round of applause for you all. journalist and speaker, I know how we keep our history alive is telling stories in platforms just like this, telling them to our children, making sure that we understand and they understand. And the beautiful thing about the world we live in now is those stories are readily available. The internet has made that so accessible. And we live in such a rich place full of history. So I hope beyond the day that you take some time to learn the, the stories of African Americans and maybe venture um, to a museum. So Heather, tell me about your grandmother. Um, how did she end up working at what was called NASA before it became NASA? Okay, so my grandmother, um, she was a teacher. And she was actually um, in a laundromat and saw a sign up that they were looking for, um, for computers. Um, basically, they were looking for women who had math, mathematics backgrounds. And so she was a math teacher. And so she decided to apply. And um, she, it was lucky at that time. She was at the right place for that. In addition, um, Roosevelt, he passed an executive order that was desegregating um, the Department of Defense. So that meant that they had to let um, African Americans come work in NACA. So she was at the right time. She was uh, a math teacher. Uh, and this was more money, actually. And it's a shame that it's still going on now that teachers aren't paid enough. But this was, this was more money. This was seen as a, a secretarial um, position. Uh, they felt that women, which might still be true today, I mean, those stereotypes are better at details and um, would be better with the math. And they had smaller hands, so they were doing the math with uh, slide rules and things like that. So they recruited a group of women, and she started December 1st, 1943. And I guess the rest is history now. Yeah. <laughs> so for those who saw Hidden Figures, um, we saw Octavia Spencer play your, the role of your grandmother. Um, did she call the family to ask about anything to get ready, especially because your grandmother was kind of tough as nails? So, um, unfortunately my grandmother died in 2008, so she wasn't alive, but um, before she passed, people would come, as Tiffany said, to try to interview her, and she would pretend to be asleep. <laughs> she, was, she was not interested in this at all. She'd be mortified that this happened. She's very, very quiet, very, very humble. Um, Octavia Spencer, we didn't have any contact with her at all. Um, I believe that um, Katherine Johnson's uh, family, they were on set and you know, they knew the family. I don't know how she did this, but she somehow embodied my grandmother to a way that I was not expecting, even the cadence of her voice. But she never, she never contacted us. <laughs> I didn't meet her till the premiere actually. So. So what did the term human computer mean? What does that mean? So the human computer, they did um, all the calculations to get the rockets up. So um, this is before computers were actually machines um, computed with pencil and paper and slide rules. So. so she was a visionary in that she saw human computing um, was going to phase out. So how did she teach herself that language Fortran? Okay, um, my late father always wanted me to say, because he was a little upset about the movie, that his mother did not steal the book. <laughs> she would not have stolen anything, let's just get that straight. But um, So she really did um, actually teach herself the programming language because she saw that they were soon going to lose their jobs. 
they're going to phase out. She saw when the IBMs were delivered, and she figured that this is something that she needed to teach herself. But not only did she teach herself, but she taught all the other women as well, so that they could secure employment as well. So your grandmother dealt with Jim Crow, prejudice, racism, every other kind of ism. Um, how did that shape her as a woman and a mother? I think that was the toughest nails. Um, she did what she had to do um, to deal with it. She never actually spoke about any hardships. She never complained. Um, my, my oldest cousin, he's in his 50s, he actually lived with her to the time when she was living, I mean, working at um, NASA. And he said that she was unflappable. And nothing bothered her, and she knew what she knew. And she knew that she was smart, and she was always prepared. So that's how she dealt with it. So you have several degrees, um, science related and now law related. How much of an emphasis did your grandmother put on education? She put a great emphasis on education. Um, it was understood that you were going to attempt college. Um, it was really no choice. I didn't know that I had a choice, so that's what I did. Um, did you ever hear her speak of her not getting any recognition when John Glenn or Alan Shepard went to space? She never, ever mentioned it. It was like she didn't even care. <laughs> she said she was, she was doing her job. And that's all she was doing was doing her job. And she didn't want accolades for anything in life at all. Um, I didn't even realize the magnitude of, you know, who she was as a woman and all the things that she did, uh, being, being a single mother and all until I read the book myself. I learned a lot about my grandmother from reading the book. Because she didn't, she didn't speak of it. She was like the quietest, most humble person ever. She was, she was mean though, but she was... <laughs> straightforward, let's say that. <laughs> but she was very, very humble. She didn't, she didn't see herself as special. Do you think more girls will go into STEM now that they've seen people like your grandmother, I Catherine Johnson? hope so. Um, going around and different speaking engagements and things like that, uh, we understand that representation is so important. And to understand that we had representation in 1943 for these women who were mathematicians. So what, what, are, what do we have that we can't, what are our obstacles? Like, think about it. Like, you have to do it. Little girls, you have to do it. You can do it. You're just as smart as anyone there. Just think about all the things that she went through. I always think about her riding from Farmville on the back of the bus by herself to start a new life. She didn't know anybody here, and she excelled. So what are, what are our excuses? We, we shouldn't have any. It's just, it's, just, it's just been a blessing. Like her legacy, she might not have had anything monetary to leave us, but just all the blessings that have come down, it's just been amazing. Thank you all. I am indeed uh, humble. Uh, I am yours truly, Frederick Douglass. I was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey on the Eastern Shore in Talbot County near St. Michael's along the Tuckahoe River. I do not know the date of my birth. Our slaves do not know the dates of their birth. The closest we could come would be planting time, harvest time, cherry time. You see, slave masters didn't want you to have any knowledge whatsoever. An educated slave is a worthless slave, is the mantra of a slave master in the 19th century. And so I was taken away from my mother, was the custom of those slave breeding states of Virginia and Maryland and North Carolina. She was sold to a plantation, the Hicks Plantation, about 12 miles away. I never saw my mother during the light of day. She would occasionally walk 24 miles round trip just to rock me to sleep at night. And by the time I woke the next morning, she would be gone and back to her field to, to answer that call. News came of her death around, when I was around 60, 16 years old. The master came to me and, and said, your mother is dead. Can you imagine never even being allowed to visit your mother during her illness or her burial? Uh, my good fortune that I was given to an older mistress on the plantation who happened to be my grandmother and she took care of me as much as a child could be taken care of uh, under the institution of slavery. I'm going to give you just uh, an insight into what it would have been like to be a slave on the in the 19th century. This is, I'm reading here, 
uh, from my first narrative. I wrote three autobiographies in my lifetime. Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom, and Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. I also printed my own newspaper, the North Star newspaper. But this is what it would have been like to be on a plantation and get your monthly allowance of food and your annual clothing allowance. Here too, the slaves of all the farms received their monthly allowance of food, eight pounds of pork or its equivalent of fish. I did say or, not and. If you received fish, you did not receive pork. If you received pork, you did not receive fish. And many times that meat would have been spoiled and you would have had to cook it very well not to get a sour stomach. Uh, the children, uh, of course, uh, when we fed, and they were fed uh, in horse troughs. Like so many pigs, we had to use uh, leaves or shells or whatever we could. The more you ate, uh, the faster you ate, the more you got. Uh, the slower you ate, the less you got. The clothing. This is for those working in the fields. Two linen shirts, one pair of linen trousers, uh, one coarse shirt like uh, made of coarse Negro cloth, uh, one pair of coarse trousers like the shirt, one pair of stockings, one pair of shoes, the whole of which could have cost no more than $7. Yes, the children, too young to work in the fields, and girls would receive neither shoes, nor jackets, nor stockings, nor trousers. Two linen shirts per year, and when those fail you, you would have went naked for the rest of the year, regardless of the weather. And so, you see, as a young boy, uh, I remember running around on the plantation, cold. I slept on the cold, hard ground with a burlap bag over my head. My feet were often out in the wintertime, uh, and I got frostbite sometimes with gashes big enough to put a pencil in. My stomach was often uh, calling me. Uh, I was hungry, but I had a voice. I, I remember being able to go to the voice and sing under the window of my master's wife. And she liked the sound of my voice, and she would occasionally pass something out the window. I, I can remember singing, uh, let's see. Uh, Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. For lo is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me. And she would come to the window and she would say, Young Freddie, I do believe that one day heaven is going to smile upon you. And I would be saying to myself, if you passed a biscuit out that window, <laughs> it would be heaven now. Yes, my task as a young boy was to be, uh, to keep up the yard, make sure the sticks and such were kept, uh, to make sure that the horses and the cows got out, that I would chew them back in. And there was this one horse who liked to run away. And my task was to go fetch the horse. And so every time I went to fetch the horse, uh, I got something to eat. I would get there and there would be a horse eating from a big pile of hay. It seems that there were more, uh, much more hay and food on the other plantation. When I brought the horse back, I got uh, some meat, uh, a slice of meat or something. And so, of course, uh, as studious as I was, I, I decided to occasionally leave the gate open. <laughs> well. There came a time, I was around eight years old, and my master's wife called and she said, uh, Freddie, we're going to send you to Baltimore to live with our cousins, Mr. Hugh and Sophia All. Now they are city people and we don't want them laughing at you, so we want you to go down to the creek and wash yourself up. We're going to give you your first pair of pants. I didn't know which excited me more, having my first pair of pants or leaving the plantation. Yes. Young man, you seem to be very well dressed there. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I, Nice pair of pants and shoes. Uh, uh, how many pair of pants do you have in your closet, sir? Well, he has so many he doesn't know. He must be a rich man. Can you imagine uh, having to get your first pair of pants when you're eight years old? But that was the situation. They gave me my first pair of pants. They sent me to Baltimore to live with Hugh and Sophia All. Now, I was to be the butler, the, the helpmate for their young son, uh, Master Thomas to help him in the mornings to get prepared for school, to walk him to school and back and in the afternoons to prepare for bed. And I can remember uh, uh, his mother, uh, Miss Sophia All, uh, had a kind representation. She had a generous spirit and uh, throughout the whole entire community. You will soon see in my narrative here that uh, slavery not only destroys the spirit of the black man, but that of the white man as well. Once you adopt the norms of slavery, 
uh, your attitude towards the rest of mankind goes down. So, uh, Mrs. All, she liked to read. Uh, she would sit in her rocking chair and read the Bible or the newspaper, and I would cozy up next to her, and she would pass an A, B, or C, and uh, maybe a word from the Bible. And once I had these words to describe my misery as a slave, my mind became free, and thus my body had to follow. You know you cannot enslave a freed mind. Once your mind is free, your body has to follow. And so I had an insatiable appetite for reading and learning, and uh, I devised various methods to, to educate myself. Uh, as we were walking to school, I would challenge the young boys who, who had their school books. I would say to a young master, well, young master, do you believe that I can make a W? And of course, he would say, what slave can write? Who taught you how to write? And I would say in a cunning kind of way, uh, well, if I show you how to make a W, you show me how to make a Q. Let's shake on it. And of course, the bet would be made. I would make the W. He would show me how to make the Q, and my vocabulary would be expanded. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you imagine having to steal every alphabet just to teach yourself how to read and write? That's what I had to do. And of course, what the master said well, eventually came true. An educated slave is a worthless slave. I became worthless for what they wanted me to do. All I wanted to do is learn and uh, figure out how to escape. They sent me back to Talbot County on, on the plantation. They put me under the servitude of a notorious slave breaker by the name of Mr. Edward Covey, who decided he was going to break my spirit. He whipped me every day for almost a year mm -hmm. until I decided to fight back. And once I did, that was the last whipping, a substantial whipping I got again in my lifetime. Yes. They sent me back to Baltimore. Now, I'm around 16 years old now, and I'm working in the shipyards of Fells Point, Baltimore. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm learning quite a bit. I'm shining shoes also on the street corners. And I purchased this book. I had seen uh, the boys carrying this book back and forth to school. It's called The Columbian Orator. It's full of great poems and speeches and such, and uh, lessons on how to become a great orator. So I purchased this book. I was attending camp meetings on the weekends in Baltimore. And at the camp meetings, we were singing songs, playing games, having church and such. And I met this fine young woman by the name of Anna Murray. Now, she was a freed woman, and I was still a slave. But I was telling her about how I had tried to escape and was jailed for three months. And uh, well, my master, Pat, bond me out, I could have been sold down to Mississippi or Alabama. Well, that we call that part of the country the Valley of the Shadow of Death. I might not be standing here if he had sold me down there. But nevertheless, uh, I'm telling Anna how I want to escape, and we devised a plan that I would dress up as a sailor. She sold her bedpost, and she uh, bought me a ticket, and she knitted me a sailor suit. I got caught a train and then a boat and ended up in New York. I sent for her and then we ended up in New Bedford, Massachusetts. We were living uh, with Mr. Nathan and Polly Johnson. I had changed my name from Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey to Frederick Johnson. And I'm living with Nathan and Polly Johnson. And it seems like every Negro that runs away calls himself Johnson. <laughs> well, I told Mr. Johnson, uh, well, we need to try find a new name for myself. I might get lost in the fray. So he was reading a poem at the time, uh, uh, an epic poem called Lady of the Lake. And in that poem, the main character's name is Douglas. And so he offered that name, and I, I took that name. And you know me now as Frederick Douglas. Well, he introduced us to a fine minister, uh, Minister Pennington, and we got married, and we started our family. Uh, we had, uh, we lived for, uh, together for 40 years. She gave me five children, Louis, Charles, Frederick Jr., Rosetta and Annie. They all lived to adults except for Annie. Annie passed away when she was 10 years old. And of course, uh, I met Mr. William Lord Garrison, who was part of the abolitionist movement. I was reading his newspaper, The Liberator, finding out all about what was abolition. They asked me to stand up and speak in a congregation like this. And of course, uh, initially I was well accepted, but then uh, people started to question my authenticity. They said, well, you, you say this man is a, is a slave? Uh, surely you've sent him to some college, and now he's passed off as a slave. He can read and write so well. Well, uh, they said, you start, you start naming names and places. Make a note of these things. When I wrote my first manuscript, I handed it to Mr. Uh, Mr. Garrison. And he said, well, either you're going to need to throw this in the fire, or we're going to need to get you out of the country. 
Yes, naming places of the atrocities you've seen, names of your masters and their overseers. So they sent me to England, in Ireland. I spent 21 months in England and Ireland. Four months in, in Ireland. Those people over there raised the money to purchase my freedom. Uh, Miss Julia Griffiths, uh, the Richardson family, uh, how much do you dare to say that, I, that they raised to purchase my freedom? Well, uh, I applaud you for not wanting to take part in, a, in an auction. We were auctioned at the block. Whole families separated. The huts left vacant. But they con contacted my master and uh, wagered uh, for $733.16. Now, they gave me a proposition. Why even go back to America? This is a free country. Uh, England has abolished slavery. Why even go back there? We'll send for your family. We'll help you purchase a house, some land. Well, I had to consider the fact that I had left my, my family there, my sisters and brothers, whole millions of my fellow men and women bondage. In bondage. I had to come back and fight for their abolition. And so that's what I did. I moved my family to Rochester. I got involved in the woman suffrage movement. This is all of the women, white and black. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Lucretia Mott. I can remember a time living on South Avenue in Rochester in the middle of the night, a knock at my door. We open the door and there stands Harriet Tubman with seven runaways from Virginia. And we brought them in, gave them a good nice rest, some shoes, and then they went on into Canada. And of course, Harriet, she went back to get more. And so, uh, uh, these were the times in, in Rochester. I went on to do some remarkable things. I became the, the provost, the US Marshal for the District of Columbia. I was a records keeper, keeper for that state. I also uh, uh, was the ambassador to the country of Haiti. I was the first black man to be nominated as a vice presidential candidate, alongside the first woman to run for president. Yes. Does anyone know the first woman to run for president? No? Someone said Shirley Chisholm? No, I don't know who she is. Sometimes they say uh, Hillary Clinton. I don't know who she is either. Yes. Uh, the first woman to run for president uh, of either race was uh, Victoria Woodhull. Oh, well, they said, uh, Mr. Douglas, we want you to run alongside uh, Ms. Victoria Woodhall. I said, I will not run. They said, well, I thought you were a woman suffrage man. I thought you stood for woman suffrage. I said, well, that's not it at all. I'm not a politician. I won't come to Chuckatuck and say one thing and then go to, back to Suffolk and say one thing just to please the audience. I am for the 100% enfranchisement of the black man in American society. So it doesn't matter how well you sleep me at night, just give me a soft pillow, good food in the morning. When it's time for me to stand and speak, I am for the 100% enfranchisement of the black man in American society. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are just some of the things that I was able to accomplish in my lifetime. Uh, and of course, uh, I was a relatively good orator. Uh, I have sometimes seen myself referred to as an orator, but for the life of me, I cannot tell why that reputation is accorded me. I am just a simple colored Maryland boy. And a thousand other colored Maryland boys could have told the story with equal skill and effect. But I did give many speeches. What to the slaves of the 4th of July, the church and prejudice, self-made men. In self-made men, I was thinking about your testimony, young lady, and your, that of your grandmother. And the fact of all the occupations you've had I think the most noble would might be that of a lawyer. You can judge a race by uh, how many lawyers there are. I mean, uh, if you're sitting at the table and you don't have a lawyer amongst the myths, there might be something amiss in that society. Right. Especially if the first time you meet a lawyer or a judge is at the, is at the jury box. <laughs> and so we need more lawyers in our midst. And thank you for, for traveling down that road. Let's travel. And so, uh, I was thinking about what uh, speech to give you here today. Uh, of course, we've been here some time. Uh, the speeches we gave at the time were at least an hour long. I understand that the, uh, I understand the modern era has a short attention span. 
Uh, so I will just give you an abbreviated version of the woman's suffrage speech. We are celebrating at this time. Uh, this is the 100th year of the woman's vote. Is that right, ladies? All right. You can now vote. Is that right? That's right. And what amendment gave you the right to vote? Oh, maybe you don't have the right to vote. Is there an amendment that gave you the right to vote? I know the 15th Amendment, they said you had to stand aside. You cannot vote yet. Uh, so I heard somebody say the 19th. I think that's right. Well, I carry my Constitution right here with me. If ever I'm challenged, that is. Uh, so you certainly don't want to be challenged at the ballot box, and then uh, you have to go home and find your Constitution. By the time you get back, the ballot box is closed, you miss your opportunity to vote. Come on, people. If there's one thing that frightens me about this modern era is that you have disenfranchised yourself from the Constitution. Yes, and so we're celebrating uh, the year of the woman's vote. And this is the speech I gave uh, uh, in 1848, July 19th, on a Sunday of 1848, at the first Woman's Suffrage Conference. I said uh, to the women there, and Many men were there to some to support, and most to ridicule the women for having the audacity to stand up and speak for themselves. But this is what I said. Mrs. President, ladies and gentlemen, I come to this platform with unusual diffidence. Although I have been long identified with the woman suffrage movement, having often spoken in its favor, I am at somewhat of a loss to know what to say on this really great and uncommon occasion where so much has been said. When I look around on this assembly and I see the many able and eloquent women full of subject and ready to speak, I would not now speak but for my early connection with the cause and having been called to do so by this council. Men have very little business here as speakers. And if they come here at all, they should take the back benches and wrap themselves in silence. For this is an international council, not for men, but for women. And woman should have all there is to say in it. This is her day in court. I've heard many men speak on this subject, some of them the most eloquent to be found anywhere in the country. But I believe no man, however gifted in thought and speech, can voice the wrongs and present the demands of woman with the skill and effect, with the power and authority of woman herself. He can neither speak for her, nor vote for her, nor act for her, nor be responsible for her. And the thing for men to do in the premises is just to get out of the way and give her the opportunity to exercise all the powers inherent in her individual personality. Her right to be and to do is as full, complete, and perfect as the right of any man on earth. I say to her, as I say to the colored people, give her fair play and hands off. There may be some well-meaning people in this audience who have never attended a woman's suffrage conference, never read a woman's suffrage newspaper, never heard a woman's suffrage speech. And they may be surprised that those who speak here do not argue the question. The demand of the hour is not argument, but assertion. Firm and inflexible assertion, assertion which has more power than the force of an argument. If there's any argument that should be made, it should be made by the opponents, not by the friends of the woman's suffrage. They will find not one reason, not one consideration that can be urged supporting the right of men to vote that does not equally support the right of women to vote. When I ran away from slavery, it was for myself. When I advocated for emancipation, it was for my people. But when I stood up for the rights of women, self was out of the question and I found a little nobility in the act. Time itself is a very conservative power, ladies. That what is, always was, and always will be world without end. We have heard this old argument before. And if you live very long, you shall hear it again. Man has become so accustomed to command and woman to obey that both parties in the relationship have hardened to their respective places and thus has piled up a mountain of iron against woman's franchisement. Such a truth is woman's right to equal liberty with man. She was born with it. It was hers before she comprehended it, and no custom law or usage can ever destroy it. So the women who have thus far caused this agitation have already embodied Theodore Parker's three grades of human greatness. First is greatness in executive and administrative ability. Secondly, uh, greatness in the ability to organize. And thirdly, in the ability to discover truth. They are seen in the proceedings 
the way they have set up the proceedings of this council. They are seen in the steady growth of their movement, not only in this country, but around the world. And it is heard in the mantra of their claim and the claim of my newspaper. Right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is the father of us all. And we are all brethren. Amen. Amen. Everyone who's here, thank you so much for your time, your talents, and using your treasures for to participate in this event today. And also, the the let's just think about the theme: living legends, rewriting social action. So the children got to speak on people who, yes, they have passed on, but there's something I hope that they will take to be able to catapult them into wanting to live up to what people in the past had to go through because they don't really understand the hardships that people endured so that they can have it easy today, but they should also not take it for granted. So thank you so much again to making this event so beautiful and thank you for your time. I just wanted everybody to take, take this time to think and have a moment that I hope that you learn something about your past and we may be able to be able to carry something positive into our future. And we all would need to go ahead and continue to keep up the good fight which is we all sometimes want to think about being able to vote and we take advantage of those things oftentimes whereas we don't do it but we have to look in terms of how far we've come to the things that we've been able to do. Um, we need to also have a greater understanding to be able to take care of one another, to love one another because of the health issues and the things that go on in this world. We want to continue to uplift one another, continue to guide one another, and to also be a partner to one another, be kind to one another, uplift one another. I can't do this by myself with the community. There's too many people to name, but I would like for all the men who make us our fire to please stand at this time. As my brother stands with me, I, I ask that you keep us in prayer. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of the giants of our ancestors. I ask that you continue to help and to pray for one another as we continue to carry the lights of the community forward. And may God continue to bless everyone and let's enjoy the continuance of our day. Thank you. Thank you.